Welcome, welcome. Welcome to tonight's Wu University's webinar, Growing Your Optometric Practice with a New Spectrum of Presbyopic Treatments with Dr. Cecilia Kenning. I am your host, Dr. Jennifer Stewart. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kenning. She's a clinical instructor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in the Department of Ophthalmology in Denver, Colorado, where we hear the weather is beautiful. Uh, we were just talking about the weather tonight. Her primary focus is in anterior segment and ocular surface disease, neurooptometry, and perioperative care. She's a fellow in the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, an active member of the AOA, and has served as both local and state officers in the AOA. She was named Young Optometrist of the Year in 2019 by the state of Virginia, receiving Vanguard of the Year Award. She lectures locally, nationally, and internationally at conferences and has written for multiple publications. Welcome, Dr. Ketting. We can't wait to hear from you tonight. I'm excited to be here. Um, it's always such a great time when I'm able to be with Wu Yu. Um, the audience is always so gracious and so involved and I really appreciate that. So it's fun. So as um, Dr. Stewart mentioned, or as Jen mentioned, if you have questions, don't hold them to the end so you don't forget them. Just put them in the chat box and we'll kind of answer them as we get to the end. Um, and as she mentioned, yes, we are going to be talking about how to grow our um, practice with all of these different presbyopia treatments that are coming out. And we're going to talk definitely about the drops, right? And that's probably going to be a big chunk of this. But we're also going to talk about um, some other things that maybe we aren't thinking about and some things that will be uh, coming to um, to our offices or, you know, to light and ability to use uh, as we um, have new FDA approvals for different devices. So, of course, these are my disclosures. They have been mitigated. And let's just jump right on it. Let's talk about the gifts of aging. And I keep the slide in here regardless of, you know, what title I have, because I love it. I love, I love working with Walt Whitley um, for better part of a decade back on the East coast. And he would jokingly say, you know, we wrinkle, we gray, we dry up. And we know that, right. But what are the other gifts of aging? Well, dryness, as you mentioned, presbyopia, cataracts, and then some acquired ptosis and dermatoslasis. And all of this starts to affect our vision. And when we talk about presbyopia and cataracts, we know that they're actually attached to each other. One is kind of the earlier stage of it. And we're going to talk a little bit about dysfunctional lens syndrome too, which is kind of what I use to open the discussion with my patients and how I like to think about it. But why are we here talking about this? Well, because guess what? If we're lucky enough, we're going to grow old enough to where we're going to go through presbyopia and have cataracts, which means we're going to have an increasingly large amount of patients who are undergoing these problems. You know, you may have what you call a pediatric or young adult practice right now. What do you think is going to happen in 20, 30 years? Well, all of a sudden we're going to be talking to them about presbyopia and we want those patients to stay with us that long of time. But 2010, 89,000, I'm sorry, 89,000, 89%, 000, 89 um, of adults over the age of 45 years old in the United States had presbyopia. Not surprising, right? We'd actually argue it's probably, you know, closer to 100, depending if they want to admit that they're having a problem. But when we look at the actual number, they're estimating that it was 1.1 billion people had presbyopia in 2015 and 1.8 billion people will have presbyopia by 2050. I'm not seeing that many patients in my clinic, right? You're not. Even together, all of us are not seeing all of those patients in our clinic. And it's really important not only to see them, yes, to help them with their vision and through a presbyopia journey and eventually into cataracts. But what about if those patients wouldn't, aren't coming to see us? When was the last time they had an eye exam? Are we seeing other problems and catching other problems? And so that's why I like the discussion of presbyopia and how to um, have more discussion, um, not just about presbyopia, but other things that are going on and why the entrance of new opportunities and new treatments for presbyopia is actually a really good thing because it may start to drive more patients into our office, which is good for us, both business-wise, as well as for our patients and their health. 
Um, so yes, continuously growing, but what is presbyopia? And, you know, we've got this lovely little picture here of what we kind of think of when it comes to presbyopia, but really what is it? And in the last, uh, maybe five years, I feel like it's something that came to my attention was something called dysfunctional lens syndrome. And this is a way to describe essentially the journey of presbyopia into cataracts. Because when we talk about presbyopia, we know that the changes that are causing that and that are in relation to it are also the same changes that we're going to be experiencing um, because of cataracts. So stage one, this tends to be our 42 to 50 year old, because we know that there's not really a specific age when we start to have presbyopia or show signs and symptoms. Somebody who's an uncorrected hyperope may actually start showing signs of and problems related to presbyopia early. Um, earlier uh, than somebody who is an emetrope or a myope because they're able to kind of uh, function a little bit better and a little bit differently. But what are we actually seeing? We're having changes in the lens because the lens, the crystalline lens is actually starting to stiffen. And because of that, it's starting to lose its elasticity and its focusing power. Um, this goes to cause the problem of losing that near vision. And we start to develop more higher order aberrations in this um, time period. Going on to stage two, it's our patients over the age of 50 where they've lost complete accommodation. Um, they are starting to have more light scatter and formation um, degrading the vision. So more relation to that cataract, right? The, the lens itself changing color and maybe getting um, some spoking and things like that. Decreased in contrast and night vision at this point. And then we get to stage three, and this is a person who's typically age 65 years or older, and they have a full cataract. Poor visual, poor visual quality, we may be seeing some decrease in the visual acuities. Um, and the nucleus of the lens is yellowing, and it's actually starting to, to truly affect the color, uh, as well as we're starting to have the opacities causing more degraded vision. So accommodation changes, why are those happening? And we won't go too far into this because this is not what it's really about, but I just like to think about this and how we're having conversations. Um, but remembering that crystalline lens, as time goes on, it becomes harder, it's becoming thicker, um, it's yellowing. We start to lose that elasticity um, of the capsule material itself. And we start getting sclerosis that causes a shift, an anterior shift of those um, equatorial fibers. We also get changes within the zonules too. We start to get an increased tension around the equatorial zones. Um, and we start to get a change in the angle of their insertion because of this. And so that, that all starts to affect our ability to, to truly um, adjust and accommodate. Another thing that's happening is remember our pupils are changing and we're definitely gonna talk about pupils for a second here because there's some goods and bads with that, right? And that's really where uh, the newer treatments with, um, with presbyopia are really honing in is the pupil and the pupil size. And as we get a decrease in the pupil size because of atrophy um, of the dilator muscle, this cart starts to mean that there's increased continuous constriction. Um, it causes a decrease in the dim versus bright um, pupil size. We don't get that movement that we, we normally would as our, our patients are younger. And this means decreased light to the retina. And there's kind of a little sweet spot here, right? Because that can actually be helpful. It gives us decreased peripheral um, optical aberrations. It gives us a little bit of an increase of depth of focus and decrease need for focusing. So we get a little benefit, but that's only to a certain extent. Once it kind of hits this point where it's below about 1.5 millimeters of a pupil size, then we actually start going the other direction. We start having more problems. Um, and this is because it's decreasing the illumination getting to the back of the retina. And so that starts to cause more problems with contrast sensitivity. Um, and then if somebody's already having trouble with getting light to the back, imagine being in a low illumination setting, and that's gonna cause more problems and more distortions. And this is actually a study, and we'll talk about this later, but it's a study looking at the optimal pupil size, and it's finding that a fixed two to three millimeter pupil or a 30% meiosis from baseline can actually help to um, produce a, an, a near visual acuity gains without affecting the distance. And again, that's really the basis for a lot of the new drops and some of the devices that are coming out. 
this is just a really cool slide. I think it's neat because we think of cataracts as an old age thing. Well, actually remember we start aging as soon as we're born, right? Okay. Same thing happens to the lens. And if you look at this, it's a continual change. And even as early as age 25 in this, we can actually kind of appreciate that the lens is starting to yellow compared to where it was at age 12, eight and six months of age. So kind of interesting, but it goes to tell us that yes, it is continuously changing. Now let's get into the fun part, right? How do you treat tresbiopia? And we've got our tried and true options. And we're not going to talk about these because guess what? You're probably more of an expert about these than I am. We know that, right? I'm not a glasses and contacts person habitually. So you guys are, are going to be the one-ups on me for this. But the over-the-counter readers, which I joke with my patients, are the one size fits no one because they're not made for them, but they work in a pinch. We've got our prescription glasses, whether it be our single vision, bifocal, progressives, and then contact lenses. And we've got options of you know, go with a standard single vision for distance and then glasses over or do a monovision or a multifocal. Um, but what we're going to talk about tonight is more of thinking outside the box. What other things can we be thinking about and what else are we actually starting to do more in clinic? And that's really talking more about refractive lens exchange um, and then LASIK PRK when we're talking about kind of surgical options with our patients. And refractive lens exchange, remember, is really just cataract surgery, but this is prior to our patient actually needing cataract surgery or meeting those um, qualifications that are set by Medicare and the insurance companies for it to be covered by them. And within this category, we have lots and lots of options. We have had so many new lenses come out and so many better options for our patients in the last, I don't know, since I've been practicing. So in the last 10 years, it's been pretty phenomenal. Um, and I'll have to tell you, it does give me pause to say when I hit that probably, you know, stage two dysfunctional lens syndrome, I might be going ahead and saying, let's go ahead and, and have a uh, um, refractive lens exchange. But so within this, we've got multiple categories and we're gonna talk a little bit about these. We've got the enhanced monofocal IOL. We've got wavefront shaping EDOF, hybrid multifocal EDOF, small aperture IOL is now available, and then light adjustable lens. And each one of these, you know, we may not be making the decision to say, hey, I think you should get this specific lens, right? But it's good for us as optometrists who are going to refer this to other doctors, to the surgeons to, to do the surgery, to know what options are there so we can know what might work for a patient, what might not, but also what are the surgeons using? You know, if you have surgeon A who is offering all of these versus surgeon B who's offering none of these, you may feel more prone to, in certain situations and with certain patients, refer the patient to one doctor versus another um, so that they have those options for the patient. And what are we thinking about when we're making those decisions, right? And what are the what are the surgeons thinking about? And my career has been spent primarily in alongside um, ophthalmology and helping with a lot of their pre and post operative care for cataract surgeries. And so a lot of this is actually very similar to what are we thinking about when we put them in a contact lens glasses, what type of contact, what type of glasses, right? We have to think about their visual needs. Who are they? What are they doing? What does their day look like? What are their visual demands? And what do they want, right? So a patient who um, says, no, I actually don't mind wearing glasses. I love them. They're part of my everyday thing, right? Maybe they're not the patient that we suggest having a full um, multifocal or EDOF. Maybe we decide to do something a little bit different. Um, lifestyle, what do they do? How busy are they? Uh, are they a rock climber where they need both up close, far away and an intermediate? Are they a truck driver where they really definitely need more of that intermediate and distance? What other things are, you know, their visual demands and kind of going to dictate these things? Daily activities. How active is this person? Um, other comorbidities, right? What other things are going on? What does their cornea look like? Do they have, um, really bad dry eye, which get that under control before you refer that out. But do they have really bad dry eye? Do they have EDMD? 
What does the back of the cornea look like? Do they have any um, butana and possibly fuse? Things that are going to cause problems with the lenses and maybe adapting. Other things, don't forget about the back of the eye. Are they macular degeneration, even if they're early? Remember, we're putting this lens in, it's going to last, in theory, the rest of their life. So what does that look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? Um, and the other thing is, and that you can really offer a good bit of information for the surgeon is, what other concerns do we have for dysphotopsia? How did they adapt to a multifocal contact lens? How did they adapt to a progressive um, bifocal, right? If they're that person who does not adapt well to them, um, they may not adapt well to certain lenses as well as let's talk about personality. Type A is type A is type A. Just because they're type A with glasses and contacts does not mean that they're not going to all of a sudden be the same way with a lens that's implanted. So give your, give your surgeon a heads up. They'll be your buddy after that. But let's talk about some, some of the lenses and you know, these are not, it's non exhaustive list, but these are some of the ones that have popped up that are being used um, fairly frequently. The Technus Synergy and Toric. Um, so they have the Synergy, uh, just um, non Toric, and they also have a Toric version. This is a hybrid multifocal EDOF. So while it is um, not a true blended EDOF, it actually still has some, or it still has the Eschelate surface, which means that it, um, it is, sorry, it still has a multifocal surface, but it's escalated, which means it still has the concentric rings, but they're not as defined. So that means we get less. That's what the escalate means. It's kind of like blended down a little bit. And that helps decrease the amount of scatter and halos compared to, say, our traditional multifocals that we were using 15 years ago. Other good thing about this is it does um, tend to eliminate the visual gap that's present in trifocals. So as opposed to having three very distinct areas, it's got a little bit more of a blend for these patient going from distance to near. An enhanced monofocal IOL is what it sounds like. It's an, a monofocal. It is in fact only meant to be, this is a different lens. So this is to be for distance only, but it actually is enhanced um, giving us a little bit of wiggle room. You get about a half a diopter or so of near vision in these, in this lens. Now it's still considered a standard IOL. And there are some surgeons that use this as their standard IOL because it's giving patients a little bit of extra near a little bump and a little bit, that a uh, little bit better amount of, um, uh, range of focus for them. Uh, and it also is good for patients to get a little bit of extra focus, a little bit of near vision, if they maybe aren't a candidate for some of the other types of lenses, like some of the true EDOFs or multifocals in cases where somebody has other comorbidities. So this might be your patient who has macular degeneration, or maybe has a history of, um, macular edema. This is a good option. Another direction to go is the Technus Ihance and Ihance Toric. This is again an enhanced monofocal, or this is that enhanced monofocal. This is the version of that. Um, so this would be that, that lens that we were talking about, that same technology where it gives just that little extra bump for the up close without being a true um, multifocal or EDOF lens. Clarion Panoptics is actually a trifocal lens. So it has three distinct areas of vision. We've got our distance, our intermediate being about computer, and then our near coming into um, about that 33 centimeters. Clarion Vividy is another one. Um, is an EDOF, so that extended depth of focus. So while not being um, a multifocal or a trifocal like the previous one, the um, panoptics, this is more blended. So a little bit less risk for patients having issues with um, diffraction or rings and whatnot. Now, though, this does not necessarily get the patient um, in their clinical studies showing that it doesn't necessarily get them all three ranges. However, I will tell you in clinic, when I've seen these patients, I'm always way more impressed with the amount of vision that they have as a full range than what they say that they're going to get. So it also does really well. 
And again, we're going through these and a lot of it's just going to come down to the surgeon's preference. And I'm just more trying to expose you to know that there are so many different options. This one is the Triumph. This is a trifocal EDOF. So another um, similar to the first one we talked about where it goes for all three uh, ranges and it has the uh, concentric rings, but it's a little less defined rings so that we don't get as much halos and glare and uh, issues with um, with dysphotopsia. I can't say that word. This one is completely different. Light adjustable lens. And it's kind of cool. I like it. Um, I was using it in my previous practice and I liked it because I actually was able to do a lot of hands-on with my patients. I did the lock-in um, procedures for my patients. So I got to be a part of this, which uh, I, I like. It does take a lot of chair time though. So what this is, is it's a lens that um, it's implanted just like a normal lens. And the material itself is actually UV absorbing. And so the patient waits about anywhere between two to four weeks after it's implanted for the uh, refraction to stabilize. Once it's stabilized, then we can start doing the treatments to adjust the shape to get the vision where we want it. So we can actually change the refractive, um, the refractive power of the lens, even after it's been implanted into the eye. Now the glasses or now the patients have to wear these really fun sunglasses all the time, just to make sure that they aren't getting a UV light into the eye prior to starting treatments that may accidentally activate the polymers and cause it to start shifting shape. Um, and then therefore modifying the shape and modifying the vision. Uh, they then have to wear those fun glasses throughout the entire time that we're doing all of the procedures, which can take up to six weeks or so. So again, a little time consuming for the patient and for us because we're doing all of these treatments, but it is something that's definitely within our wheelhouse. Obviously check with your state association to make sure that this is okay. You have to put that sidebar in there, but look at the machine. What does that look like? looks like a slit lamp. It does. Guess what we use all day? looks like we use a slit lamp. Um, and you actually use this little lens that you put on the eye that is like a Gagne lens. You focus it, you focus the rings, they're dilated, you're holding it um, steady just to activate the polymers. It's anywhere between 15 seconds, I think is the shortest that it goes to about a minute and a half. So not too bad. Kind of cool. Welcome. Aptera. This is a small uh, aperture IOL design uh, lens that's implanted. So we'll talk about um, other um, attempts at something similar to this, but it's actually got uh, this little nanoparticles of carbon that are inside the lens itself, creating an, um, that black circle that you're seeing. Now the particles are very small and light can still get through. If you actually look at it, they're micro perforated. So there's lots of spaces throughout um, that, black, that black ring that allow light through, which helps both the patient as far as functionality um, with nighttime vision, as well as allows us to see in the back. Um, but there, you know, there is that concern, obviously in some patients, is this gonna be an issue with being able to see into the retina? Um, but that was the idea behind that. I have not had any patients. This actually just was uh, released and the first ones were implanted. Maybe I think this video is Dr. Yu um, implanting the lens two months ago. So this is pretty recent. So I have not had a chance to see any patients yet though. And the idea is no, we are not putting this in two eyes. This goes in one eye. So we're kind of using the monovision idea um, with one eye getting a little bit of an extended depth of focus with the um, IC8 or the Aptera. So that's what's out there, the general gist of what's out there. What's coming next on IOL? We got a lot of really cool, neat things that are coming, different modular systems and ones that are actually accommodative IOLs. I'm not going to go into these, but a lot of the idea of what they're using is some of them are using fluid haptics where it's actually using some of our natural um, anatomy to uh, push on the haptics. So you remember the haptics are what kind of hold it in place. And you see the one down at the bottom right of the screen. It pushes fluid 
from the haptics into the center. And all of them kind of function under the idea of you're creating more of a prolate shape. So you're changing the shape in the center of the lens so that it changes how the lens is focusing the um, the light on the retina. And so we get a little bit of extended depth of focus. We're actually able to accommodate a true, a truer version of accommodation. So kind of neat. We'll see what comes to fruition over the coming years. This is another, um, this is actually being done outside the United States. It's not being done in the United States. This is in FDA, um, investigation at this point, but it's called Pixel. And what it's doing is it's actually using uh, corneal cross-linking to re, uh, reconfigure the shape of the front surface, creating a more prolate shape uh, in the center area. Again, changing the refractive power of that front, uh, refractive power of that cornea so that we're able to get um, near vision with it. Now, this is something in theory that would be done one eye only because then you would have one eye that is near vision, the other eye that is distance vision because this is being done to change the shape in the center. Now, we are probably a little bit more familiar um, with SMILE. And if you remember, SMILE is small incision lenticular extraction. And this is very similar to LASIK and actually seeing laser as opposed to creating a LASIK flap though, they keep the, the entire cornea intact. They don't create a flap that's lifted up to then treat. They actually use the laser to treat within the stromal bed and it creates this little lenticule. And that little lenticule is then extracted through a small incision, hence the name. Now you can see a photo here. They create that, they're creating a pocket. They make a lenticule within the pocket with the laser. They then pull that lenticule out. And there's some complications that can happen with this, which is why it's really not something I feel that um, all ophthalmologists do um, is because there's a pretty steep learning curve and a lot of um, a lot of things that can kind of happen with it. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about future applications, right? So what else can we do with this? Well, guess what? They've been saving all those little lenticules that come out. They've been cryopreserving them for years. I don't know why, because on a rainy day, I guess we just want to have some extra little lenticules, uh, little pieces of some cornea tissue to do something with. Well, apparently, yes, because what they're looking at is then going and taking that um, allogenic corneal inlay. So taking, and, and thankfully, remember, cornea tissue is, is, is avascular, which is why we have a very low uh, rejection rate with corneal tissue. So the idea is take that little lenticule that may have come out from whomever, maybe you save your own, I don't know, and you put it into the pocket. And again, it is changing the shape. So we're making a more prolate shape of the cornea and changing the refractive power. And this is, again, looking at the principle of um, monovision. Apparently, we're never going to get away from monovision. We're just going to do it in different capacities. So Interesting. Again, being done outside the United States, not within the United States at this point, is being is under investigation. Last future thing that's kind of interesting to talk about. This is called um, sorry, where's the lyric? And what this is is it's actually a low energy, high repetition rate femtosecond laser that is used non-surgically to alter the refractive index of um, transparent materials and tissues. So our cornea, our lens, um, and so actually changing the light bending properties of that tissue, which would then give us the ability to maybe have one eye that's uh, a near vision and one eye that's a, a, um, a one eye that's distance, one eye that's near. Sorry, going back to the monovision. So, but it's a different, you know, possibly being applied to not just the cornea that we've been talking to, talking about, but also maybe possibly the lens itself. So kind of interesting. Can't talk about the possibles and the R's without talking about the swings and the misses. Um, and I do talk about this because you may still see a patient with one of these other devices 
that have been used in the not so distant past. And that way we know what maybe to expect or what are we even just looking at? So one of the two that have been recalled and are no longer being actively implanted and most have been explanted um, is the raindrop. And this was a near vision inlay. So creating a pocket. So LASIK surgery, lift the flap. They put this clear corneal inlay into the stromal bed and then close the flap. And then again, it created a prolate shape. So it changed the shape of the corneal surface uh, of the cornea in that central area to allow for more focus power. Second one, the camera small aperture inlay. Um, this was similar to, it looks similar to the ICA, right? Or the aphthera. This was a, a small uh, aperture put into the same idea, create a flap, put it into the stromal bed, close it, and then they're able to focus. Now, both of these had a lot of problems with um, infections and with scarring, um, with having to use heavy amounts of steroids that then caused, unfortunately, induction of uh, cataracts in these patients who probably already had early cataracts. So if you happen to see one of these, there you go. Take a picture, send it to me. I'd love to know if they're still out there. I know in our clinic, we did um, remove all of our raindrops and we helped, uh, we never put in the uh, cameras, but we did take out and we did explain quite a few of them. Okay, now let's get to the meat of this, right? This is really, I think, where we as optometrists need to start owning this space. It's that whole new box. The ocular pharmaceuticals, it's here. It's not, not coming. And I want to try to research a little bit of excitement for this, okay? We know that there has been one that has come out and some patient has, it's worked well for many patients. It hasn't, and that's okay, right? How many of the multifocal contact lenses have you gone through with some patients? We know that some work for some patients. Sometimes we may have a really good just general fit ratio with one um, particular brand, but it's not abnormal. Um, and while this isn't glaucoma, right? Because we know that that's, that's pretty darn serious. I'm not trying to equate it to that, but think about glaucoma too. We don't give everybody the same glaucoma medication. We think about what's working for them, what's not. When one thing doesn't work, we pivot. And guess what? This is the pipeline. We are going to be able to pivot very soon and have a better idea of what's going to work. So I don't want you to be frustrated. I want you to be excited because I know I'm, I'm like right there at that beginning of my, um, dysfunctional lens syndrome. And I want options. I want options, which tell me other people want options. My patients want options. And going back to that thing that I said earlier about driving patients into our chair. I think this is something that can help with that. I saw a little bit of that with the Vuity drop when that first came out. And I think that it's going to continue to happen as more of these come out. And we just need to say, we need to stay excited. So what are we looking at here? I'm going to talk more about, we're going to go a little bit more into the ones that are getting really close to FDA approval and, or making it onto the market just because there's more data. Um, but do know that there's quite a bit of them that are getting ready to come out. And we're going to talk about how they kind of break down the most, um, the mo the one that is getting ready to come out next is really, we're looking at Orisys's CSF one. They've already submitted to the FDA for FDA approval. Their PDUFA date, as we'll talk about, is actually October. Ah, we're in September, not far, right? Now, that doesn't mean, remember, just because they have FDA approval, it does not mean we're going to have it then. It means that it will be approved, and then they're going to continue to work to get things ready. So I guess probably if you had to call me a betting person, I'd bet we're probably getting it in 2024. But the idea is all of these are working under pupil modulation. There was another drug, and I took it off of here, that was looking at lens softening. Um, and that, unfortunately, they have pulled from uh, they have pulled from FDA trials. Um, and I, I think it just was lack of interest. There was not anything that had happened or that they've released saying that there was um, bad data or concern for risks but we may see more of that in the future. So as of right now, we're talking about pupil modulation. And remember me talking about pupil modulation before, right? There's a sweet spot. We don't want it too small. 
we don't want it too big. There's kind of an area where it shows that it, it tends to work. Now, is that the hard and fast? Nope. Because I'll tell you my patients who where Vuity worked, where I was really surprised were my patients who were in their eighties and had really tiny pupils to begin with, but it's about what is functional for them. And is it enough for them? So don't always assume we have to get them to a certain spot, but the other things we need to think about is like, which patients is this going to work for? And I know that there's some other lectures in this series for Woo You later in the month where they're going to get into more of these things. Um, but I want us to start thinking about it, right? So age range, you know, baseline refraction and what are their needs? And I, I think the biggest thing here to me is actually what's their near vision needs and the range that they want. What is, what is their demand? Because I kind of, I wasn't throwing it at everything to see what stick, but I might've been throwing it at everything to see what stick with beauty, just because studies are studies, people are people. And I'm going to find different things work for different people. And I was a little bit more um, okay with just seeing what worked as long as it was something I felt was safe for that patient. So I think that that's going to be very similar to how I'm going to at least approach as the other drops come out is looking at where do these work and um to, and kind of where, right? Where and who, and for what demands age is going to come in there at some point, but we're also going to start to think about what is this patient's need, right? As far as duration of effect, how quick is it going to onset? How am I going to tell them to use this? Take it before you brush your teeth, take it when you get to work. Um, how much is it going to reduce the night vision? And I'll tell you right now, We'll see some of this in patients. I'm sure that we're going to get a reduction in night vision, but any one of the drops that are going to be FDA approved, they all have the same, um, the same endpoints that they have to meet, which is they cannot lose more than a certain amount of letters at distance. And they have to get at least three lines or more of near vision improvement. So if it's FDA approved, they're all going to hit those end marks. And I think that's one thing that's good to keep in mind. The big thing though, expectations, right? It's not just us picking the right patients. It's us. It's about us managing expectations with those patients. We have to do it with our multifocal contact lenses. We have to do it with our progressive glasses. We have to do it with IOLs, right? Everything is about ex and managing expectations and setting them up for success. I find that if I give people more understanding about what to expect, I'm setting them up for success and less chair time for me. So when we talk about these, I kind of break it down into three pharmaceutical categories. We've got pilocarpine, um, sorry, not three, pilocarpine, carbacol, acyclidine, and bromonidine. Now, bromonidine is actually being added into some of these other ones. So it's not its own little category, but each of these are the active ingredients that we're seeing in um, the different category or the different um, drugs that are being uh, explored for presbyopia treatment. I'm not going to go a lot into beauty because we've talked about beauty, right? This is not the one that's coming up. This is the one that's out. Um, if you haven't had a chance to get your hand on it and try it with patients, I do encourage you to do that. Um, just because you will find that some patients really do enjoy this and it really works for them. Um, it is not, you know, necessarily the one size fits all, but I don't think any of these are going to be, I think it's going to be, uh, we find what works for each person in maybe some small categories. We'll find out. We'll have this conversation in two years and it'll be completely different. But it's pilocarpine based. Remember, it's that 1.25% pilocarpine was recently re FDA approved for BID dosing. Surprise, surprise. That's what I was doing anyway. Um, and we know that the concern, um, the big concern that we've had this last year with Vuity was the rate of retinal detachments. I say be smart. And with any of these, do a good dilated fundus exam, get your optos, get your, you know, your, your photos in patients that you feel concerned about, or for me, cause I'm just going to de facto do it because it's in my office, get an OCT of the macula, look for any traction or anything that might put them at a higher risk and have the conversation with the patient. If you look at the numbers, the numbers of the amount of patients who had a retinal detachment, I think the last time I checked were like 81 out of 80,000 um, filled prescriptions. 
is a lower percentage than patients getting retinal detachments after cataract surgery. So it's still pretty low, but it doesn't mean we should ignore it, right? We just have to be smart about it. So let's jump into a different one. Orisys, the next one that's probably going to hit market. Um, this is also pilocarpine, right? But it is a different percentage. It is a 0.4% um, percentage pilocarpine, and it is preservative free which is for me, ocular surface disease person, very happy about that. Um, it is up to twice a day dosing. So the way that they suggest that this is going to be used is a patient can use it twice a day if they need. Uh, I actually had some patients view it once a day was enough for what they needed it for. I think it's going to be similar here. Patient finds that they need it um, once a day. They can just use it once a day for whatever demands they need. If they are a person who might need it twice a day, they wait about two to three hours and they put that dose in. How did I figure out who needs what? Well, with Vuity, I said, everybody's going to use this once a day for two weeks. A couple of different reasons. One, I want them to, with the ciliary spasm, I want them to get used to that um, and get everything to calm down, uh, so that they aren't getting those low brow headaches as well as they're not getting the true spasm where they're getting, um, kind of wonky in and out vision. Um, second thing is they can then have to use it in multiple situations and get a better feeling for when it's going to work and when it might not. Um, so I think I'm going to do the same thing here. Again, big things to remember, low dose pilocarpine 0.4. Um, it, they are finding that it, the effect is out to eight hours, which is great because I don't know how many of you have a day that's less than eight hours, but mine is not near neutral pH for comfort, also being that preservative free. But if a date, meaning FDA in theory will give them the thumbs up, you're okay to go, is October 22nd. Um, and looking at the data, they found that, again, half, we all have to hit the same data points, right, for their primary endpoints. They were finding um, they maintained a three-line improvement in near vision from 20 minutes. So about 20 minutes is when people are getting the effective effectivity of this drop and lasting up to about eight hours. They also then, not as a primary endpoint, but a secondary endpoint, looked at the two-line gain comparable um, to achieving functional near vision. Because we know that what's true functional vision, it doesn't mean however many lines we gain, it's where are they at, where did they start? And what they looked at was 2040 or better, which I'll tell you, I think 2040 or better is pretty functional. And again, this is also looking at the pupil reduction size that we talk about and finding that the pupil reduction size at about 20 minutes went from average of 3.4 down to 2.7 and maintained about 2.7 with a little up and down. Remember, we get that second dose at about two to three hours until about that eight hours. So that's a good, that's a good overall. This is looking at the um, adverse event overall, well tolerated, very safe. Let's keep chugging along because we got a couple good ones to go through here. Um, this is Vices th Therapeutics. So theirs is Brimacol and car and, um, that's a, it's a additive of Carbacol and Bromonidine. And they actually have two studies looking at just Carbacol on its own and Bromonidine, Carbacol and Bromonidine. And they have to do that because they have to show the, uh, benefit of additive, of, um, things and show that there's a cumulative improvement when you add things together when you put two different components together. So why is this one working differently? Well, instead of pilocarpine, while this is actually a historical glaucoma medication, it works a little bit different. This is working as a parasympathomatic um, that mimics the effect of uh, acetylcholine on the um, muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. And so it affects the iris sphincter muscle, activating it to decrease the pupil size but um, it doesn't, uh, we don't get that ciliary spasm that we do with pilocarpine. Bromonidine is actually working to contract the muscle, the ciliary, ciliary muscle, but it also helps to, um, by it attaching to some of the other receptors, muscarinic receptors, it keeps carbacol in the area longer. So it actually lengthens the effect of the carbacol by helping keep carbacol in the area and competing for some of those same receptors. Kind of cool. The other thing that's beneficial, whitens the eye. Why do we have Lumofy? Bromonidine whitens the eye. So you get a little benefit there. 
So this is the studies and that's what, again, it's showing is that both Brimacol formulations um, respond significantly, both the Brimacol um, preservative, this one's looking at preservative-free, Brimacol, non-preservative-free, and then also Carbacol. So it's looking at the additive effects and finding that Brimacol, um, Brimonidine, and Carbacol together had a better effect than just Carbacol or Brimonidine by themselves. Um, this is actually their phase two studies. And they're getting ready to go into phase three. I think they've actually already started phase three, right? I'm sorry, phase three is already, that was phase two studies. They haven't released the um, the charts of phase three, but again, has met its endpoints. Endpoints being the same as all of them have a certain amount of patients receive or getting to an increase of three lines or more near without affecting the distance vision more than two lines. I think interesting looking at the study here is that they had 45 to 80 year old age, years of age were included. They also included patients who were phagic and pseudophagic. So um, we're looking at a good range of patients here. Uh, they did find that there was, you know, statistically secondary endpoints on top of the um, ones that are required by the FDA. They found a good um, statistically significant proportion of subjects achieved 10 later gain at uh, near distance. Um, and they also had a high level of patients achieving uh, at least 20, 40 or near visual acuity. So again, talking about that functional vision versus what does three lines mean, right? Um, again, talking about that contribution of that bromonidine helping to, um, with the overall performance of that carbocol and keeping it in its area so it has a longer performance time as well as a little bit of whitening. Guess who else is doing something similar using the bromonidine lens, which is really cool. So they're adding it in too. But their act, other active ingredient is different. They're using a cyclidine. Now, a cyclidine has never been used in the United States. This was used in Europe for years. Um, they've got years and years of data. This was used for glaucoma as well. And it targets the iris sphincter and avoids that ciliary stimulation. Um, the active ingredient, sorry, active ingredient concentration or the active ingredient itself would have to be at a very, very high concentration to actually stimulate that ciliary muscle. So not an issue there. Um, they are currently, you know, finishing up phase two and recruiting currently for phase three. They've got the two. And again, this is similar to the other drug. We have to show additive benefits. So they're looking at lens by itself, um, the acyclidine, 1.75% acyclidine. Um, and then they're looking at lens 101, which is the acyclidine plus a bromonidine. Bromonidine doing the same cool thing here, which is um, competing for the muscarinic receptors so that it keeps the acyclidine in the area longer so that we get longer acting um, drug out of this. It also a little bit of whitening. So not bad thing. This drug is also preservative free. So I believe um, the visus is not preservative free. Whereas this, the lens drop is also preservative free, similar to Oris's drop. Studies coming out of this um, looking again at the pupil diameter, and they're finding that the pupil diameter gets right into that sweet spot at about half an hour. Um, they get down to that 1.6 millimeters and maintains there for 10 hours. That's pretty good. Um, again, primary endpoint, first one, what the FDA re requires. Um, within one hour, they're um, hitting that endpoint. So statistically significant amount of um, patients uh, achieving three lines or better with near vision. They were getting to 73% and 62% um, between their two drops, either the lens one or the lens and the lens 101 compared to the placebo. And that was within 30 minutes. So that's a pretty strong response there. Now, if you look at the lines, the gray ones are the lens 100, which if we remember that's the acyclidine by itself, and then the lens 101, um, getting at 62%, that's the uh, bromonidine plus the um, plus the acyclidine. However, so maybe it's not as many people at that 30 minutes, but look at that 10 hour. The 101, we've got 48% of the patients um, that were at that were in that arm were still hitting um, statistically significant improvement with that three line improvement at 10 hours. That's, that's, that's a full day at work, right? 
Again, this is the secondary looking at two lines. So they're looking at a, um, even more specific, uh, or I'm sorry, even larger subset of uh, patients here uh, and finding that at least two lines, because one person might find that three lines is the what they need. Many other people, two lines. Did I start at 2060 and three lines gets me to 2030 and that's my functional? Am I starting at 2040 and two lines actually gets me to 2025 and that's functional? So it all kind of, you know, we have to look at it that way. And the other thing here is, again, making sure it's not impacting the distance vision um, in normal and low light, which it did not. Last but not least, Occupier Pharma. Um, they are in their phase two data right now. Uh, I'm sorry, phase two studies right now. So they're still coming along. Um, but this is Nixol, which is a low dose pilocarpine. So kind of going back to that pilocarpine family, but it's also adding in, uh, I'm sorry, Nixol is the fentanylamine, but it's adding with low dose pilocarpine. So we get the, the benefits of the pilocarpine that we know how that's working. Plus the phenylalanine, which is a non-selective alpha adrenergic agonist that inhibits the contraction of the smooth muscle in the iris. So um, the pilocarpine works on the sphincter and the uh, phenylalanine works on the smooth muscle of the iris. So we're getting a dual mechanism here. And they're again, doing well as far as meeting the primary endpoints of three lines um, or more improvement in that near vision in 63% of patients um, that are using it. So this is the long short of kind of what makes them different. But what I want is I want you to remember this is not going to hurt our practice in the long run. It's an adjunctive therapy. It's an and or an or. It's not a replacement. It's options. And we want options. I want options. Our patients want options. Our concerns that are there, we just have to think about, you know, as far as concerns for retinal detachments and safeties in our patients. Um we need to be smart, dilate them, think about things. Who's a good candidate? Who's maybe not? Who's at a higher risk as far as retinal detachments? And then, like I said, this may be something that's an opportunity for our practice to grow. It may make an access for our patients that we don't normally see. Those patients that have been getting the one size fits no one over the counters or nothing and think that they don't have any options. So this could make a huge um, practice builder for us.